A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 342. And it's the Oculoplasty module number 17. Today is a special day because it is our international masterclass. We have our very own Dr. Gangadhar Sundar, who's a very well-known face in our Oculoplasty community, and a very special uh, invited guest speaker, Dr. Sandeep Upal, sir, all the way from Singapore. So Dr. Gangadhar Sundar will be covering an overview of aging, surgical anatomy, brow lift, and Dr. Sandeep sir will be covering principles of safe and effective facelift. A very brief introduction uh, of them to our audience. So Dr. Ganga sir is currently the head orbit and ocular facial surgery department of the ophthalmology National University Hospital, Singapore, and assistant professor of the department of ophthalmology of NUH. Uh, so he has uh, done his DO and FRC education and diplomat of American Board of Ophthalmology. And he's a preceptor of the fellowship program in orbit and ocular facial surgery, Department of Ophthalmology. He's the vice president of the Asia Pacific Society for Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, vice president of Singapore Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and chair scientific committee of Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society. He also instituted the very prestigious Gangadhar Sundar Award of the Ocular Pl uh, Plastic Association of India, something that we all look forward to when we are presenting the papers and want to win. And he has been the recipient of Senior Achievement Award, uh, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, Hong Kong, Professor Dr. N. Rajan Memorial Oration, Rajan Eye Care Hospital, Chennai, Best Teacher Award and Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence uh, from National University of Singapore, and Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award in 2011. He's also the reviewer of Orbit, Journal of Craniomaxillofacial Surgery and Trauma, Singapore Medical Journal, Asian Journal of Ophthalmology, Journal of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, British Journal of Ophthalmology. A very, very warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, and Dr. Sandeep Pupil, sir, is currently the Senior Consultant, Otolaryngology uh, and Head of Facial Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Services, Head of the Department of uh, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Ku Tech Pua Hospital in Singapore. And he has done his residency from University of Delhi. He has been the fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and Ireland. And he's also uh, held position in the Governing Council of International Federation of Facial Plastic Surgery Societies and International Board for Certification in Facial Plastic Reconstructive Surgery, Vice President of the Pan-Asia Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Vice Chairman for Facial Reconstruction for Facial Reconstructive and Cosmetic Surgery, India Trust. He's a section editor for rhinology and facial plastic surgery section of the book, Symptom-Oriented Otolaryngology uh, Head and Neck Surgery, and has written several book chapters, numerous publications in the peer-reviewed international journals, as well as presentations at various international courses, workshops, and conferences. He's also the course director of 11 Days of Facial Plastic Surgery, an annual fresh frozen cadaveric dissection course. He's the national examiner and member of examination developmental committee for otolaryngology exit examination in Singapore. A very, very warm welcome to both of you and over to you. We are so looking forward to the lectures today. Thank you, Shpana. Thank you, Akrisha Fali. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, really honored to be invited uh, once again by Dr. Santosh Hanavar and uh, team iFocus. Uh, I know you guys do a brilliant job of uh, spreading the knowledge and education, not just in India, but along Asia Pacific and globally. And, uh, and a warm welcome to my good friend, Dr. Sandeep Pupal, who's willing to share his expertise with our, us ophthalmologists and oculoplastic surgeons. My 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna to try to cover a little bit of pathophysiology of the aging phase. And more commonly, the various forms of brow lifts that we do in oculofacial uh, rejuvenation. It is important to realize as we as oculoplastic surgeons do not perform as much brow lifts as we should be doing, especially if we're dealing with the aged population, because every single time you do an blepharoplasty or a ptosis in the elderly population, if you do not address a brow ptosis, you are bound to have residual issues. So we look at beauty as such. Beauty is very subjective. And I'll let you read this in a few seconds. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's not what you and I think as the model of beauty itself. So it's important to realize that beauty is not just physical, but it's emotional, cultural as well. There's huge cultural perspectives. It varies, the definition of beauty varies from the cultural background, geographical background, 
You can have a pan-Asian or pan-global phase thanks to AI at this point of time, but there are certain proportions and harmony that we have to keep in mind. Naturally, when you're young, you're beautiful, regardless what your brow looks like, what the nose looks like, what your lip looks like, and the moment you have a smile on your face. But as you grow older, you lose some of these advantages that you have in the youth. Therefore, when you talk about goals of rejuvenation in an old patient, you're talking about rejuvenation, making themselves look like a younger version of themselves. Whereas when you're talking about aesthetic surgery in younger people, you're talking more, more about harmonization, beautification, even changing some of the parameters on the face itself. An important thing that we all appreciate in nature is the golden uh, principle of golden proportions. And naturally, it's not the nose alone, the eye alone, the lip alone, and how they harmonize in a certain proportion that gives real beauty itself. So what do we age? And when do we really start aging? We even attend a two-year-old baby's birthday. We always talk about a two-year-old. We don't talk about two-year young, which means that aging starts literally the day we are born. But thankfully, the building blocks kind of build up in a very positive way till about 20 to 35 years of age. And unfortunately, from there on and downhill. So I don't want it to be a depressing fact. But it's important to realize that the peak of your beauty and health is around 35. And as we live longer and longer till about 70s and 80s and 90s, it's important to realize how important it is to take care of ourselves right from young and not start taking care of our health in the 40s and 50s. And that's something that very important we have to realize. So what are the factors that really affect aging? There are three variables that we do not usually have control over. One is genetics. So we tend to age the way our parents age. So if you wanna look at yourself, how you will be, uh, barring AI technology, just look at your parents and you kind of know where you're going to be and you can start planning your uh, aging prevention measures one way or the other. Ethnicity is the second important factor. We'll talk a little bit about it. And finally, the, one of the price we pay for sitting up and walking erect is gravitation changes. But there are other factors which really do play a role and that's something we don't oftentimes pay attention to, but we should be really be paying attention to. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these as well. So if you look at this particular patient, you can see all the signs of aging, receding hairline, you can see forehead rhytides, these are not dynamic rhytides, which are static rapid rhytides, significant brow ptosis, pseudo and a true dermatoculasis. You can't see the ptosis over here, mid-facial aging, the jowls and the chin, so on and so forth. And that's what really we are gonna be addressing it. But when you're analyzing the patient, you actually think of the patient in layers, right from the skin, the aging changes that happens, to the subcutaneous tissue, the various pad pads of the face, which Dr. Sandeep will talk about, aging changes that happens because the muscles of facial expression, the laxity from ligaments, and, the, and finally, and most importantly, what we don't realize is the bony support of the soft tissues. We also age based on our ethnicity and profile. The way we re react to ultraviolet rays, for example, in a way, the brown skin is, and the dark skin is more protected compared to a lighter skin or even the Caucasians. We know that from experience. That's where photo aging and photo protection is very, very important in a light pigmented races compared to the darker pigmented races. Here the examples are degeneration that occurs over time, causing not just laxity and wrinkles, but more importantly, even pigmentary changes that happens. So it's important to consider some form of UV protection. SPF 15 to 20 is more than sufficient. You don't, don't need to go to 50 to really prevent aging or photo aging changes. The next important thing is the role of gravity. Yes, we are vertical creatures. We are vertical most of the times. Surprisingly, even people who lie down on one side or the other, they seem to have more aging changes on the side they lie down compared to the other side itself. So gravity plays a role. And if you do believe in evolution, you realize the longer the face you are, the lesser the gravitational changes. And the more flatter the face you are, the more you're going to like, likely to have gravitational changes once laxity sets in. So that's where the facial profile from the oblique and the lateral view is just as important as, as you evaluate the patient's form of frontal view. So these are the factors that you do not have any control over. But what you have control over is the abuse of tobacco and alcohol. It's been shown that preventing or minimizing to a maximum about abuse of tobacco and alcohol significantly reduces the aging changes that happens over time itself. And what are the typical skin-related changes that happens? You can get thinning of the skin, you get loss of turgidity, you actually have a dehydration of the skin. You get melanocytic, asymmetrical, and variable proliferation and with a variable hyper and hypopigmentation and very dry skin. And thus you develop a very thin, thick skin like a pachydermatocele 
and the various pigmentations that we see, each of which can be uh, high, uh, ad, uh, addressed in a different way. Likewise, when you see wrinkles at the face, as a resident, you have to realize that all wrinkles are not the same. There are dynamic wrinkles from active contraction of the muscles perpendicular to the line of action of the muscles, which can be modulated with your neuromodulators. And the static wrinkles, which are present once you have dynamic wrinkles perpetually for decades on end, which cannot be eliminated with neuromodulators, but hence will benefit from rejuvenating surgical procedures. So examples of patients where you have dynamic wrinkles, neuromodulators, Botox, Dysport, whatever you want to use. If you have static wrinkles, you may have to cut tissue out to make it uh, what it was like originally before itself. Another important aspect of which predisposes to aging is the amount to which we use our muscles. That's where you realize all these theater actors, even TV personalities and news readers, the more animated the faces are, the more emotions they express on their face, the more they develop, going to develop initially dynamic wrinkles, which even eventually become permanent wrinkles. And for the same animation that happens, eventually laxity and in my situation, the brow ptosis we're going to talk about also happens. Another aspect of aging that happens is as you grow older, loss of fat on the face, lipoatrophy as such. And that's similar to a nice fresh grape versus the raisins that you see. And these are situations where nowadays we're talking about volumization of the face with autologous fat transfers or tissue fillers, where you're able to plump up the face again to restore the rejuvenation of the face itself. So total volume of the face can be lost. And that's where the knowledge of the various fat pockets of the face is very important. These can happen either because of atrophy that happens. Remember the facial fat is one of the last fat to disappear when you're going through malnutrition, especially the cheek fat pad and the orbital fat pad, but you can also get descent and hence elevating these fat pads with various ligamentary suspension sutures along with tightening or releasing the ligaments so that you can have better control of the fat pads is very important. The last aspect of aging is what we don't realize often is a bony aspect of aging, whereas regression and retrusion of the various bony orbital rims, which in turn result in the various features that we see, including the supramedial fat pad, inferotemporal fat pad, the fluid festoons that we get on the, at the bottom as well. And these are the where the vectors of the face changes, which has to be restored if you're talking about various rejuvenation with tissue fillers itself. Therefore, when you look at all the aging of the changes of the face, it starts everywhere from the top to the forehead region, to the brow region and the upper eyelid. In soft tissue, this is considered the upper part of the face, uh, soft tissue skeleton. Whereas we look at the bony anatomy, generally the orbit is considered part of the mid face. But from a soft tissue point of view, mid face starts from the lateral canthal angle, the lower lid, cheek, the jowls, and so on and so forth, which Dr. Sandeep will be talking about. And I'm going to be focusing more on the upper part of the face, which is the brow lifts. So these are, the, in summary, the various aspects of aging, the changes that happens. So when you're talking about rejuvenation, you think of the six R's. You can relax a muscle using muscle relaxants or neuromodulatory agents. The loss of volume can be refilled with various forms of tissue fillers, including autologous fat transfers. Skin creases, fine creases can be modulated with resurfacing. You can restore tightness of the tissues with various forms of the radio frequency devices. But what we're going to be talking today is about release, racing, replacing, and refixing tissues. And that's where rejuvenation really comes in. So that leads to automatically the brow lift we're going to be talking about. Keep in mind that brow lift in my, or in at least our university practice, is performed just as much as upper eyelid surgeries in the elderly population. Oftentimes, it's combined with any of these procedures itself. We'll talk about indications, the various techniques, the danger zones, the fixation, and risks and complications itself. Keeping in mind that brow lift is not a pure aesthetic procedure, but it's oftentimes a very functional procedure. In fact, if you're doing facial rejuvenation, facelifts, and all this stuff, when you start dealing with facial palsy patients, all the involutional aged patients, they are the ideal candidates for whom you start working on these procedures before you embark on surgical rehabilitation of the normal or the aesthetic face. So the principles of brow ptosis management is stabilization and elevation, depending on what you're going to be doing. You're talking about the mid-face, you can talk about the fat pads and the various folds. And I think that's probably the holy grail of mid-facial rejuvenation. And Dr. Sandeep will talk about the lower face itself. So it's very important to assess the patient. You don't assess the patient just from a physical point of view, but you want to also assess the emotional component to it, what the patient's expectations are, and what is the motivation for them to seek various forms of brow or face slip surgery. Likewise, when you're looking at a patient's face, you're planning in the back of your head where am I going to hide the incision for this patient? 
you're mentally thinking of the planes of dissection and making sure you avoid the danger zones of the face, how you're going to fix these patients, and finally, and most importantly, managing expectations. So these are examples of patients who all require some form of upper, form, upper facial rejuvenation. And here you're looking at a gentleman who's using his frontalis with frontalis creasing. Here's a patient who's got a completely receded hairline with thick mid-facial uh, forehead furrows. Here's a place where you cannot hide any incisions or scars in the, anywhere in the forehead right at the top itself. And then you're looking at women who have a nice dense hairline, whether they comb the hair backwards or forwards, and whether there's associated aging changes. This is what determines how you're going to be planning your brow lift itself. One of the golden principles in an age stretched face is excision is a form of fixation. So when you're dealing with a very lax loose skin, you cannot do a good facelift without tissue uh, removal, especially the skin removal. Dr. Sandeep can give his expert comment on that. But if you don't have much laxity, that's when the other forms of fixation comes in and we'll touch a little bit about it. We talk about bone fixation through bone tunnels in the central part of the face. We talk about using the deep temple fascia in the temple part of the face. We talk about using tissue glue. We used to use endotines in the past, which I don't do much anymore. It's also important to keep in mind the danger zones of the face. And when you're dissecting these planes, keeping in mind the motor nerves, you don't want to cause a facial paralysis when you're doing the various forms of dissection. And likewise, you don't want to cause a permanent paresthesia when you're doing it as well. Keep that in mind. And we do make these marks on the face so that you know where to be careful or using endoscopic or open guidance to make sure you prevent damage to the various branches, sensory and motor. We won't talk about the minimally invasive procedures, but we'll talk about the conventional procedures itself. By default, uh, the most common form of a brow lift procedure we do is a direct or supra brow lift right above the brow done under local anesthesia in and out 45 minutes gives you a one-to-one -one elevation that you want. And we published our experience more than about 10 years ago. So direct brow lift is, my opinion, the workhorse of all brow lift procedures in patients where you have decent brow who have a tall forehead. You can hide your wrinkles right over here, mark the supraorbital notch and the supraorbital nerve. The advantage of a direct brow lift is you get a one-to-one -one elevation. You get exactly the way you want. Good for patients who have a thick brow hair. You can camouflage the scar. Or even if the scar is visible, you can tattoo, especially in ladies, can be done in the local, using local anesthesia in the office itself. But you have to choose your patient and make sure you give a nice good wound. Here's an example of a patient who was referred to us for ptosis and blepharoplasty. All he's had is a direct brow lift and look at the effacement of the vertical papillary fissure. Patient is very happy, doesn't need any upper lid skin excised. Yes, people do some form of internal trans uh, blepharoplasty brow pexy. Remember, there's only a pexy, not an elevation. Typically, we use this for patients who actually need some form of brow lift, but not keen on a brow lift procedure where you use a blepharoplasty or ptosis incision and stabilize the rim to, to prevent further brow droop itself. The other form of a brow lift that you can do is a mid forehead lift. It's patients like these who have deep furrows in the forehead, so you can conveniently hide your scars right over here itself. In the interest of time, I'll move on. But the only disadvantage is if you again create a bad scar, it's there for the whole world to see. So be careful about wound closure. Here's an example of a patient who had a mid-forehead lift. As you can see over here, no eyelid surgery done at all with good visual, visual clear access that you can avoid a blepharoplasty and ptosis for these patients. The second most common brow lift procedure that we do, at least in our practice, is a trichoplastic or pretracheal lift. As you can see in this patient who tend to comb their hair, who have a tall forehead, you can hide your incision beautifully behind the airline and see the amount of wrinkles that can be completely gotten rid of with the trichopratic lift with the brow really raised itself. And that's usually done either under deep sedation or ideally under general anesthesia, marking the danger zone as we talked about right over here, subperiostal or subcutaneous or subgalial dissection. We tend to use subgalial dissection, go to the subperiostal plane about a couple of centimeters above the rim, excise, tighten, so that you can elevate these patients itself. And there are numerous advantages. Here's an example of a patient right on the table, the kind of elevation that you get with the trichoplastic or a, a, a brow lift itself, more patients like that. We do use a temporal brow lift in patients where your incisions are in the central area, there's a lot of lateral hooding. You use the deep temporal, uh, uh, deep layer of the deep temporal fascia that you can see in the temporal region along the vectors of the face. In the temporal region, we use suture fixation. Whereas in the central region, you use superiorsal fixation. You can see the elevation of even the mid face that you can get with the temporal incision itself. The gold standard of all brow lift procedures is a coronal brow lift. 
This is Dr. Shruti, who was with us more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe. We used to do a lot of these for aesthetic rejuvenation, but nowadays patients are not too keen about it. But that's considered the gold standard, similar to an external DCR. Huge advantages in the sense that you can address various parts of the face using a good uh, coronal lift. You use the same incision we use for craniofacial surgeries or complex orbitofacial fractures. It's not strange to us. The only difficulty is it's remote. The incision site is remote from where you really want the brow elevation. Hence, you have to dissect more and you have to resect more skin for the same amount of elevation compared to a direct brow lift itself. These are the various steps of procedures over here. Subperiosteal dissection, preserving the supraorbital nerve. Sometimes the supratrochlear you can get away with from damaging itself, doing a periosteal release. Then you, once you do the excising, you end up doing some form of fixation as you can see over here itself. Excision is a form of fixation. Here's an example of a patient who had a stage rejuvenation. The first stage was just a brow lift procedure, raised and stabilized the brows, the forehead was taken care of, then you take care of the eyelid so that you can get very good results. And finally, the most important thing is the endoscopic brow lift. This can technically be done even without an endoscope, ideally reserved for patients who do who need uh, rejuvenation of the upper part of the face using uh, for much younger patients who don't want any of these large incisions, where again, the danger zones come important using endoscope uh, in the subperiosteal plane to identify where the supraorbital nerve is, where the sentinel vein is, and the frontal branch of the facial nerve is, prevent damage in all those areas, release a periosteum over here, and then go ahead to uh, some form of elevation. Centrally, like I said, using bone tunnels, and temporarily using the deep layer or deep temple fascia. And these are the kind of results that you can get. So in summary, in my personal opinion, brow lifts are not performed as much as we should be doing it. In our book, it's a very common ocular facial procedure. It's probably the step one for any involutional patient who has got significant brow mobility and ptosis. It can be done isolated or combined, as you can see over here. It also adds to the versatility of the surgeon. Keep in mind that there should be patient-specific approaches based on the hairline, what the patient choices are, so that you can maximize outcomes and with good technique, you can minimize complications. And once you're taking care of the brow, that's when the mid-face comes in. And this is a very challenging topic. And we have, rightly speaking, a great expert we have, Dr. Sandeep Upal, who's gonna to talk to us more. Over to you, Sandeep. Thanks a lot for joining us. Right. Thank you, Ganga. Very nice talk. Okay, here we go. So firstly, thank you for inviting me for this uh, wonderful forum. I've just uh, gone through your uh, YouTube uh, site and I can see so many nice presentations. And uh, I think over the next few weeks, I'll go through some of them uh, just to learn myself. So uh, I work at Kutakpa Hospital in Singapore. And uh, this is uh, the hospital that we have. Uh, it's a beautiful hospital. Uh, please come and visit us sometime. We have a very nice course every year uh, covering all aspects of facial plastic surgery. So something to look forward to. So these are my disclosures. Uh, this is a book I'm involved with. And uh, this is actually a very nice paper that I wrote recently on uh, surgical anatomy for facelift. And I would recommend uh, you to read through this paper. And if, you're, uh, um, if you want, I can actually send you a copy of this and uh, you can distribute uh, amongst uh, yourself. So our learning objectives uh, for this talk are we're going to talk a lot about surgical anatomy, which is basic, which is the basis of uh, all the uh, facelift procedures that we do. And once you understand the anatomy, then uh, uh, the next step of doing the surgery itself becomes much easier and safer. So we'll talk about anatomy of the face, the neck, the smash layer, the retaining ligaments of the face and the neck, the subspace potential spaces, soft tissue planes uh, for dissection and facelift, and obviously, the elephant in the room, which everyone is afraid of, facial nerve, and its relationship to the various facial layers, spaces, and ligaments. So I'll quickly go through some of the aging-related changes in the face and neck. So uh, in the face, uh, we have the three sort of subunits, the lid cheek unit, the nasal labial unit, and the mela uh, unit. And uh, so in a youthful uh, state, when we are all young, the mid cheek is actually a single convexity going from the lower uh, lid all the way to the lower part of the mid face. But as we age, there is uh, there are some changes which uh, Dr. Ganga sort of mentioned. So the first thing that happens is there is pseudo herniation of fat around the orbit, which leads to this convexity just under the eye, and this double convexity of the face because the mid face tissues are the atrophy, 
uh, the fat atrophies or it descends. So you get, get this uh, junction between the lid and the cheek, um, which uh, with the, uh, some sort of uh, uh, the bony, uh, underlying bony tissue becomes uh, uh, easily seen uh, through the skin. Uh, so uh, that is what leads to this uh, deformity. So you can also have uh, uh, prominence of the fat without any laxity of the skin as seen on the left here, or with laxity of the skin as uh, seen in this gentleman on the right. You can have festoons or malar uh, crescents which form. So this is malar crescent. You can have involution uh, ectropion, which uh, you are all aware of. And uh, then some festoons shown here. The low lid actually appears longer because uh, the orbicularis ocular muscle relaxes as well. And uh, again, this, uh, this skeletalization of the uh, uh, tissues uh, around uh, the low part of the low lid. Uh, in the sort of orbital rim uh, area. So these are some of the other changes which happen. Um, like I said, the lower uh, lid becomes longer. Then you have the tear tuft deformity. There's uh, descent of the tissues of the mid face along with some atrophy. Uh, as a result, uh, you get this formation of jowls. You also have the uh, prominence of the uh, malolabial fold um, and uh, the labiomental fold. And along with that, you have uh, the pre- um, uh, jowl sulcus, which becomes uh, more prominent as well. And then there are certain changes in the neck as well. So you can see in this uh, gentleman that on the lateral view, uh, the tissues under the neck have become more prominent. Uh, so you have this uh, uh, deformity in which there's laxity of the skin just under the chin. And as a result um, of this, uh, the cervical mental angle becomes more obtuse, ill-defined, and the lower border of the mandible also becomes uh, less defined. And these are all features of aging. And uh, the reason that we have this is because, uh, firstly, there's laxity of the skin, as well as the platysmal muscle. You get platysmal banding. And also, there's uh, excess uh, subcutaneous fat or deep fat uh, of the neck, uh, which needs to be resolved uh, by facelift surgery. So we'll talk about that uh, later on. So let's go to the surgical anatomy. Uh, Dr. Ganga showed this uh, slide as well, and this is very important. So you have to think of... Uh, the layers of the face in the same terms as layers of the scalp. So from, super, from superficial to deep, we have the skin. Then we have the subcutaneous tissue. Then we have uh, the smash layer uh, in the face, which is equivalent to the galea um, in the scalp. Then you have the retaining ligaments and uh, sub-smash spaces, potential spaces in the face, which is equivalent to the loose areolar tissue in the scalp. And finally, the deepest layer is the periosteum and deep fascia in different parts of the face and neck, which is equivalent to the periosteum uh, in the scalp. And uh, you'll see later uh, when I show you the uh, uh, different slides that uh, you can actually trace all these layers from the scalp to the face. And uh, these form important landmarks uh, for surgery, as well as uh, uh, some of these uh, tissues can be used for anchoring and the tissues that you're trying to sort of elevate and suspend. So starting from uh, layer one, which is the skin. So the skin is the top layer. Then you have uh, the subcutaneous uh, tissue. The subcutaneous tissue itself consists of two parts, the subcutaneous fat and the fibrous retinacular cutis, which are ex uh, essentially the extension of the deep ligaments going into the skin and attaching to the dermis. And as you can see here, in places where uh, the fat is thin, uh, these ligaments uh, are uh, stronger and more vertically placed. And in areas where there's more fat, especially in the areas over uh, the sub -smash spaces, and these uh, fibers are more horizontally placed and sparse. So the, the important part, the point here is that uh, in areas where, uh, where the fibrous retinic, retinacular cutis is uh, more dense, you have to use sharp dissection uh, uh, during facelift surgery, and in other areas, it's easier to dissect even using scissors. We talked about this earlier. Dr. Ganga showed you a similar slide. So the subcutaneous fat of the face is actually divided into various compartments, uh, and this happens because you have all these septae or ligaments passing between these uh, uh, different fat compartments, and these have been sort of uh, artificially divided into nasal labels fat compartment, then uh, the medial fat compartment, then you have the middle cheek fat compartment, the lateral temporal cheek fat compartment, and finally 
the infraorbital fat compartment. And as you can see here, there's all these sort of ligaments. We separate these fat compartments from uh, one another. And the importance here is that these ligaments and uh, adhesions actually, uh, the ligaments coming from the deeper layers and going into the skin. And this is what divides uh, the fat into various compartments. But from a point, a point of view of uh, facelift surgery, actually it doesn't really matter. And we don't really have to think of them as separate compartments. But uh, what is important is that we want to elevate the malar fat pad, which is the mid-face uh, area, and reposition it in a more uh, youthful uh, sort of uh, position uh, to achieve the results. So the equivalent layer in the neck of the superficial fat compartment is uh, the superficial uh, neck fat. And here in this uh, uh, cadaveric dissection, the skin has actually been dissected uh, laterally. And you can see the superficial uh, fat uh, in the neck going all the way from the chin down to the uh, level of the cricoid and below, and laterally, uh, all the way uh, laterally to the some uh, submandibular uh, area. So that's the fat uh, shown from the, from the frontal view. So below this fat layer, you have uh, the superficial and the deep cervical fascia. So the superficial cervical fascia actually divides into two layers, uh, superficial and deep. And the important said is that the muscles uh, of facial expression, as well as the platysma muscle, they are sort of uh, enveloped in this uh, division between the two uh, layers of the superficial uh, cervical uh, fascia. And this uh, sort of, uh, uh, a composite of muscle and fascia is what we call as mass, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. Then you have the deep uh, fascia, which I'll uh, talk about later. Then comes the layer three, which is a smas, which is what I was just talking about uh, a minute ago. And this is represented by the galia in the scalp, the temporal parietal fascia in the temple area. Then you have the orbicularis fascia in the periorbital area, the smas in the mid and low face, and finally the platysma uh, in the neck. So platysma is a very thin muscle and uh, uh, sort of attached uh, between the two uh, sides, you have uh, the platysma fascia, which is a very thin layer of fascia uh, connecting the two platysma muscles. And there are various uh, decomposition patterns of uh, the platysma muscle. The type one as seen here is the commonest. And uh, with aging, uh, the muscle relaxes and uh, sort of parts, and that leads to platysmal banding. And uh, this is one of the things that we have to address during a facelift uh, procedure. And this can be done through a midline platysma uh, corset kind of approach in which we make a small incision in the submental area and uh, dissect the uh, platysma muscle on both the sides, and then use sutures to bring the uh, two sides together. Occasionally, we also have to resect part of the platysma and or transect it and then suture it in the midline to give better definition, definition uh, to the submental uh, area. So this uh, midline approach uh, works, but uh, uh, there are certain issues uh, with that. So what has happened over the years is that people have started to move to a more lateral approach to platysma uh, sort of uh, elevation and uh, um, uh, the reason for that is that uh, if you use the midline platysma plasty approach, what you're doing is bunching the platysma muscle and the tissues in the submental area. And so when you lift the tissues laterally, all this bunching causes a bit of uh, heaviness in the, in the very area which you're trying to define. So instead of doing that, what people have started doing is to use this lateral approach in which the platysma is actually raised laterally as a platysma flap. And then we raise the whole thing uh, laterally. Thus, uh, making the submental area uh, more uh, defined. And the idea here is that the cervical mental angle should become defined. And along with that, when you pull the tissues more laterally and uh, the direction of pull in the neck is uh, more superior lateral, then uh, uh, the, the submental area becomes defined along with the inferior border of the mandible. So this is uh, what I was talking about. So if you tighten uh, the midline tissues, um, you placate that and then you lift the tissues here, so firstly, what happens is that the midline placation is acting against the pull that you're trying to achieve. And along with that, there's munching of tissues in that area. So unless the dehiscence is more than two and a half to three centimeter, or there's a lot of redundant tissue, especially uh, superficial or the deep fat 
in that area, then uh, you would have to do a, a sort of platysma uh, uh, approach. But otherwise, you can get away with just doing a lateral approach in these patients. So this is extended lateral subplatysmal dissection approach. So essentially, we have the cervical retaining ligaments, which are condensations between the platysma muscle and the sternomastoid fascia uh, in this part of the neck. So one can actually um, incise that area, release the ligaments, and then lift a subplatysmal flap and uh, raise that all the way anteriorly to the level of the submandibular gland, and then lift the tissues laterally so that uh, we can have that pull uh, translate into pull into the submental area, and then uh, that would lead to definition in that area. So this is how it is done. Um, we'll uh, do a sub smash dissection, which I'll uh, cover later on. Uh, in the face, the dissection is carried on into the neck. Then we release the cervicofacial ligaments in this area here, uh, make a neck flap, and then uh, as you can see here, these are ligaments, and these can be released. Then we make a neck flap, and then that flap is sort of elevated and hooked onto the mastoid periosteum, thus elevating uh, the platysma muscle and the neck. So the idea here is that we want to have a separate vector of pull in the face as well as in the neck. In the face, the vector of pull is more vertical. It is sort of 45 to 60 degrees uh, um, uh, superior lateral, whereas in the neck, we want a more horizontal vector of uh, and left, um, and that leads to better definition of the uh, lower border of the mandible as well, once we use these two separate vectors. But if you use just one flap, then the vector of pull in the neck is not very ideal, and uh, the definition of the neck is not going to be that good. So this is essentially what we're doing here. With extended subplatysmal neck flap, uh, and we have substantially more movement of tissue, and then midline platysmal plasty approaches. And as you can see here, this cut here, is what uh, separates the neck flap from the uh, face flap. This is hooked up more sort of superiorly, uh, vertically, and this is hooked up more laterally, um, superior laterally uh, to the mastoid uh, periosteum. So you have two different vectors, one in the neck and one in the face. So coming to the deepest layer, I'll come to layer four later because there's a lot to talk about layer four, uh, but uh, just going one uh, layer deeper than that, is the we have the deep fascia or the periosteum. So essentially, uh, in the scalp, you have the periosteum. In the temple area, that becomes the deep temporal fascia. Uh, and then over the zygomatic arch, you have uh, the periosteum again. Then in the face, uh, the same layer is the parotid mesetric fascia, which is actually the fascia uh, overlying the mesetric muscle. And all the branches of the facial nerve, as you can see here, actually lie under this uh, glistening fascia, which covers, which is just superficial to the masseter muscle. So this is the parotid gland here. Just anterior to the parotid gland, you have the masseter muscle. And covering that muscle, you have this parotid masseter fascia. So the fascia is going all the way from the parotid, covering the masseter muscle. And the branches of the facial nerve, once they come out of the parotid uh, gland, are actually uh, deep to this, uh, um, this fascia. So you can see all these branches here. And if you just follow them back, you'll see that they, all of them at some stage are under this fascia. So if you if we stay superficial to this fascia during the section, then the branches of facial nerve are going to be safe. And I'll cover each branch in uh, much more detail uh, later on in the presentation. So then uh, uh, in the neck, we have the deep cervical fascia, which is continuation of this layer. And this covers all the deeper tissues, including the submandibular gland, the marginal mandibular nerve, and also the sternomastoid uh, muscle. You can see here, this is a fascia over the sternomastoid muscle. And as you can see here, the greater great auricular nerve is actually underneath this fascia, it's deep to the fascia. And uh, once you remove the fascia, you can see the branches of the great auricular nerve. There are various branching patterns uh, which uh, this nerve can have, but essentially all the branches lie within this 30 degree angle. Uh, so when we're dissecting, we know that we have to be sort of uh, very careful in this area, not to breach the fascia and uh, just stay superficial to it so that uh, the great auricular nerve is protected. And this is the one nerve which is damaged uh, most often in uh, face clip surgery. So in the uh, vicinity of uh, uh, the ear lobule, you have the auricular branch um, or the lobular branch of the great auricular nerve, which supplies the sensation to the uh, to the ear, that becomes quite superficial. So in this area, we have to be extremely careful when dissecting 
The flap in this area is actually subcutaneous flap, but if you go slightly deeper, you can actually breach uh, the, uh, the deep fascia, uh, which lies over the sternomastoid, and then there's a chance that you may damage uh, the lobular branch and lead to numbness of the ear. So the surface marking for this nerve is this uh, vertical line from the tragus to antitragus going all the way to the McKinney's point here. So the, the auricular branch is going to be somewhere in this area here. So we can be just a, a bit more careful during dissection, subcutaneous dissection, not to damage uh, that nerve. Then deep to the uh, uh, deep fascia, we have uh, the deep cervical fat pad. And actually, in most of the patients, it's not the superficial fat pad, but the deep cervical fat pad, which is more abundant. And this is the one that is removed if the uh, cervical mental angle is uh, ill-defined. At times, patients will have uh, excess fat in the superficial pocket as well. But usually, we don't remove so much of fat from that pocket because if you remove too much of fat, then you can lead to adhesions between the skin and uh, um, and, the, uh, and the underlying tissues, and that leads to like a cobra uh, neck deformity and irregularity in that area. So most of the fat removal is actually done in this layer here, uh, deep to the platysma muscle. So this fat pad again goes all the way uh, to the um, uh, cricoid area and laterally over the submandibular gland. Once you remove the fat, you can see the anterior bellies of the diagastic muscle, and these can also be prominent in a group of patients where uh, the patients have a short neck or uh, and there's a lot of fullness in that area. If the muscle is bulky, then part of the muscle may also need to be removed uh, during facelift surgery. So then once we dissect laterally over the uh, lower part of the anterior belly of the diagastric under this deep cervical fat pad, that will lead us to the uh, capsule of the submandibular gland. And in a very small proportion of patients, the submandibular gland is also tautic. And that can lead to this uh, ill-defined lower border of the mandible. And that may need to be addressed by partial resection uh, of the gland. So this kind of lady uh, will have uh, sort of elements, all these things that we talked about. And surgery so may then require excision of the uh, sub, uh, subcutaneous fat, the superficial fat pocket, the deep fat, fat as well, as uh, the anterior bellies of diagastric, and also part of the submandibular gland. Um, but I must say that submandibular gland excision is extremely rare. And uh, in fact, many surgeons prefer not to perform it because the rate of salicyl formation is quite high uh, when you do that. So uh, it's preferred not to do that. And uh, what you can do is to just inform the patient beforehand that this is a problem, that you have this tautic gland, but I prefer not to do it because it has uh, increased risk of uh, complication. Then coming to layer four, and we're going to spend a bit of time on layer four. So in the scalp, layer four is a loose areolar tissue. And uh, in, in the face, uh, we have this subsmass uh, space or potential space, I should say, which is layer four. And the importance of this is that, uh, as you can see, this space goes all the way uh, from uh, uh, the lower part of the face uh, to the temple area uh, with uh, a bit of a uh, break in the middle here along the zygomatic uh, arch. And essentially what happens is that all these ligaments, the osseocutaneous ligament, which is the um, zygomatic cutaneous ligament here, or the mesetric cutaneous ligaments going from the masseter muscle and tear part uh, to the skin are passing through that layer. And more importantly, branches of facial nerve which innervate all the muscles of expression in the anterior face, pass from under the mesetic, um, uh, parotid mesetic fascia. And then they, uh, in, the, in the vicinity of these ligaments, they start becoming superficial. And uh, when you approach the anterior end of the, uh, of the masseter muscle, they start becoming superficial and go uh, anteriorly to supply the muscles of facial expression. So all those nerve branches are actually in close proximity uh, to these ligaments. So when we are uh, dissecting and releasing these ligaments, we have to be extremely careful not to damage the branches of the facial nerve. So um, this is just to sort of emphasize that uh, you may not have thought about this, but actually the lateral part of a face, the posterior part of a face is, uh, doesn't move. This part is actually immobile. All the expressions of the face and the front, uh, front part of the face 
and all the muscles of facial expression act on that part of the face. So any facelift procedure actually needs to address, uh, address uh, lifting of tissues in this part of the face. So that's to show you, uh, we have all these ligaments going all the way from the temple. We have uh, the conjoint tendon in this area here, then the lateral orbital and uh, thickening. Then we have the zygomatic cutaneous ligaments, the mesotic cutaneous ligaments, and the mandibular cutaneous ligaments. So there's this layer of ligaments which separates in the mobile anterior part of the face from the more sort of static posterior part of the face. So if you can imagine, if you're doing any procedure which is lifting this mass, or just the skin in the posterior part of the face, it's not really doing much uh, to the more mobile anterior part of the face where most of the aging has actually happened. So that's why sub, uh, some of the uh, approaches which are not subs mass are not that effective. And I'll show you that uh, in a minute. So these are the ligaments that we release, the zygomatic cutaneous and the mesotic cutaneous ligaments during deep plane uh, face slip procedure. Very rarely we release the mandibular cutaneous ligament as well. Um, but when we release the zygomatic cutaneous and the mesotic cutaneous ligaments, you're essentially going self-smash, releasing this, then releasing the tissues in the anterior face, and then lifting up the whole of the anterior face, the smash, as well as uh, uh, the sub, uh, cutaneous uh, fat, which is the malar fat pad, and the skin as one unit. And then whatever excess tissue can be excised, and then we suture it uh, after anchoring it uh, to, um, uh, to some of the sort of anchor points uh, in the lateral part uh, of the face. So when we release the ligaments, these ligaments actually also become anchor points for taking the sutures and anchoring them to either the platysma auricular fascia here or uh, uh, the deep temporal fascia, uh, which is again a strong fascia uh, used for anchoring or the mastoid periosteum. So uh, once we uh, go into the sub plane, you can see all these ligaments here. So this is where the incision would have been made. So this is marked here. And once you make the incision and lift up the tissues, you can see and with the just minimal amount of dissection also, you can see all these ligaments which come into view. So this is the pre-zygomatic space which has been dissected. This is the zygomatic arch area. This is the posterior face. This is uh, what we call as the deep pain transition zone, which has been sort of uh, entered. And then we are going to the anterior face. And I'll show more details of that in a minute. So once... Uh, we enter these spaces, then you can uh, see the pre zygomatic space here, the upper and the middle pre mesotic spaces, and the lower pre mesotic space. And these are ligaments the upper key mesotic uh, cutaneous ligament, the lower key mesotic cutaneous ligament. And uh, uh, all the branches of the facial nerve will actually be coming out from the uh, under the parotid, parotid mesotic fascia in this area here and then going to the anterior face and becoming more superficial somewhere in this vicinity of the ligaments. So we know that these are the areas where we have to be really, really careful uh, during the section. Okay, let's talk about spaces because uh, we use these spaces to perform um, safe dissection. And we know that we can enter these spaces easily. And once we have identified the spaces, then we just have to join them together by releasing the ligaments, uh, just being away from the facial nerve. So the first space is the pre-zygomatic space. And this is the space uh, just uh, superficial to the zygoma. You can see that here. So the roof of the space is formed by the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle. And uh, just underneath that, we have the sooth which lines uh, the space. The superior surface is by the orbitomalar ligament, which separates this space from the preceptal space, which is a space just anterior to the orbital septum, which covers the orbital fat. And all of you are very sort of familiar with the anatomy in this area. Then on the posterior part of the space, we have uh, the zygomatic cutaneous ligament that I showed you earlier that we need to release to mobilize the tissues, the malar fat pad, uh, in the interior face. And uh, as you can see here in this uh, illustration, you also have this minor cutaneous, uh, zygomatic cutaneous ligaments along the inferior part of this space, which also need to be released. And in the posterior part of the space, we have the zygomaticus major muscle, which arises uh, from the bone. And we dissect superficial to this muscle uh, to prevent injury to the branches of the facial nerve, which actually supply 
the muscle as well as the minor um, zygomatic uh, uh, muscle from the undersurface. So if you stay superficial to the muscle, then you're going to be safe. So then the medial extension of this uh, is the tear trough ligament, which is released during uh, low lid uh, um, blepharoplasty, especially if you're performing uh, fat transposition. Then we release this and uh, reposition the orbital fat and to cover the tear trough. So again, uh, this is a dissection section that I performed a couple of weeks ago. And you can see here uh, the spaces. You have the orbicularis oculi, the sooth, the preceptal space, and the orbital malar ligament, the prezygomatic space, and the major muscle is here, which has already been uh, dissecting and uh, dissected. So I'm superficial to the muscle here, then I've gone more anteriorly, and then you can see the minor um, zygomatic cutaneous ligaments uh, in this area here, which also will need to be released. So um, the malar fat pad um, is superficial to the orbicularis uh, uh, ocular muscle. As you can see here, again, this illustration shows the zygomaticus major muscle, and the prezygomatic space in this area here, and the malar fat patch, which has been elevated. And again, this uh, dissection shows that the uh, scissors is actually in the prezygomatic uh, space, and you can go all the way anteriorly uh, along the inferior part of the orbit to the nasal label, uh, nasal uh, facial groove uh, with your dissection using this technique. Again, this just shows the release of the zygomatic uh, cutaneous ligament, also called the McGregor's patch. And it's very important to release this because this is a very strong ligament and it really holds the tissues uh, 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 strongly in this area. If you don't release it, you can't really move the malar fat pad uh, superior laterally. And, uh, and that would really restrict how much movement you can get in the mid face uh, with any deep plane uh, facelift procedure. So uh, coming to the uh, ligaments, the zygomatic cutaneous ligament is actually about four and a half to five and a half centimeter anterior to the tragus. It is present just along the anterior inferior part of the zygomatic arch. Then we also have the upper and the lower key mesetic uh, cutaneous ligaments and the minor cutaneous ligaments. Now the upper key ligament, the lower key ligament are about 3.7 to 5.2 centimeter anterior to the uh, tragus. So these are released. Then you have the pre space. I showed you earlier, there are three spaces. The largest one of them is the pre, uh, is the lower pre space shown here in this blue, um, with this blue uh, area in the illustration. As you can see, the roof is formed by the platysma. So the platysma goes all the way from the neck is attached to the lower part of the mandible, the lower border of the mandible, and then it goes into the face all the way to the mid face. And this is what forms the roof of the low pre-mesetic space. And as you can see here, the branches of the facial nerve, and you would have the lower buccal branch in this area here, are actually under the floor of this space, under the floor, under the parotid mesetic fascia. So they're not actually in the space, but under the space. And similarly, the marginal mandibular nerve is actually in this mesentery, which forms the uh, lower border of the space. Again, the nerve is outside the space in this mesentery, which forms the border between the space and the neck. So the branches of the facial nerve are actually outside the space. So if you're dissecting the space, you're in a uh, safe zone. Um, till the time you come to this ligaments, when the branches actually become close to the ligaments and then you have to be a bit careful. So we have the masseter muscle here, the platysma here, which forms the roof, the ligaments, which form the anterior border. And the most anterior border of this is the mandibular cutaneous ligament that I showed you earlier. So the space goes all the way to that. And this is the lower boundary. And you have the marginal mandibular nerve. And the buccal nerve, which is outside the space, uh, uh, outside the floor. And then we have the masticator space, which is just anterior to this ligament, medial to the anterior border of the uh, masseter muscle. So again, the other space, the upper, um, uh, actually this is the middle space, the upper space would be somewhere here. And 
Uh, so all these spaces are entered. So the posterior border of these spaces is this platysma auricular fascia, which is actually condensation between the fascia covering the parotid gland as well as uh, the parotid fascia. So the SMAS as well as the parotid fascia condense into really dense fascia over the uh, parotid. And that's the reason why the lateral part of the face is uh, not mobile, because there's real, really a lot of condensation of tissues in this area here. But this helps us uh, in facelift procedure because all these anchor points where we release the ligaments can be sort of uh, hooked up to these uh, uh, fascias. One of them is the platysma auricular fascia, but you also have the deep uh, temporal fascia and also the mastoid periosteum. So these are the anchor points during facelip surgery. So what are the different approaches? How do we enter into the subsmass space uh, to release uh, the tissues and elevate them? So various approaches. The one I prefer is this. You uh, draw a line from the lateral canthus to the angle of the mandible. And uh, then you can also extend it into the neck um, and just posterior to the posterior border of the uh, parotid gland and along the anterior border of the standard muscle. And uh, you make incision in this mass. Then we can enter all those spaces that, that I talked about earlier. So this is what you would see once you enter that space. And then we have to release all these ligaments. Um, so an uh, easy way of dissecting the lower premacetic space is that once you have identified the space here, you just put your finger in and that would go all the way to the mandibular cutaneous ligament here and it would automatically stop in that area. So you know you're in the space, all the branches of the facial nerve are going to be outside the space, so you're safe. A similar thing can also be done for the pre uh, sorry, the pre um, uh, zygomatic space. Again, we make a, an incision through the tissues over the zygoma. There are no branches of the facial nerve in that area and go all the way to the bone, just superficial to the periosteum. You go into uh, the tissues, you get into this pocket, the pre uh, zygomatic space. Then you can use the finger and go all the way to the nasofacial groove. Uh, yeah, so one more space that I want to talk about is the buccal space. So this is a space here, just anterior to the masseter muscle, anterior to this ligaments that we talked about earlier, the masseter cutaneous ligaments, the key ligaments. Um, and in the youthful um, sort of patient, all this uh, space is actually superior to the level of the uh, lateral canthus. So this is where we have the buccal fat band. And the branches of the facial nerve actually lie superficial to the buccal fat pad, except uh, that some of the recent studies have shown that maybe one or two branches can actually go through it. And the reason we're talking about this is that in a proportion of patients, the buccal fat pad can actually be very prominent and part of it may need to be excised. So if you want to excise it through this approach, it can be done, but then you have to be careful that the branches of the facial nerve are actually uh, superficial to this uh, fat pad. So when you're removing the fat, you have to be a bit careful and also not to use diathermy in that area. So that's the buccal fat pad. You can see the branches of the facial nerve. Again, another uh, dissection. This was done uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Again, you can see the key mesotic cutaneous ligament, the branches of the facial nerve here, here. This is the communi communicating branch, which goes just over the buccal fat pad. Uh, so this is the uh, masseter muscle. You can see it's just anterior to that, just anterior to the key ligaments here. And uh, these are the facial um, artery and the vein, uh, which you can see here. And this is the marginal mandibular nerve, which we talked about earlier. This is the parotid duct that you can see, and the zygomatic branch, then uh, the zygomaticus major muscle. Okay. So, um, yeah, so what happens with aging? So with aging, uh, there's differential laxity of tissues. So as you saw, the spaces, um, the superficial uh, part of the spaces is uh, formed by this uh, platysma muscle. And so there's no real ligament in that area. So that uh, area is, has more of a tendency to uh, relax and uh, a prolapse uh, with age as compared to the ligaments which intervene these spaces. And so as a result of that, if there is uh, laxity in the pre and the lower pre uh, mesotic space, you can end up with having jowls. So this is the lower pre mesotic space, you'd have jowls as a result. 
On the other hand, if there's laxity of uh, tissues in the buccal space, you would end up with this uh, prolapse of tissue. So normally, um, the space would be superior to the level of the um, uh, lateral canthus. But with aging, there's prolapse of tissues here, prolapse of fat, and then that leads to formation of labial mandibular fold, which becomes more uh, prominent. So this is one of the signs of aging, and we may have to address that with the facelift procedure. So then coming to incisions, what are the incisions we make for facelift? So this is the typical incision that one would make. So uh, using the principles of facial plastic surgery in which we make incisions at the junction between uh, different units, subunits of the face. So here we're making incision between the ear and the face, so it's well hidden. Then it goes behind the tragus, so that part is hidden. Then it follows this uh, junction between the ear lobule and the face, usually you'd have a small crease in this area as well. So again, the incision is hidden. So this is uh, more of a close-up of that area, how we make the incisions. So this part of the incision is made about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half under the ear lobule. Then we take that incision behind the ear in the post-articular groove, and then it can go either uh, along the junction between the hairline and the um, post auricular skin or into the hairline. So that part is hidden as well. So something like that, it goes into the hair or, uh, and, and anteriorly, uh, it, go, it follows a sort of uh, uh, tuft of uh, hair in this area here. And uh, so when we remove the skin, when we sort of lift up the skin, um, the, uh, you'd uh, remove the excess skin and then suture uh, the rest of it in this area here. And the incision is always made beveled in this area here, so that uh, when the uh, hair follicles grow back, the hair grows back, it goes through the incision, thus hiding the incision. This is another way of doing it. In males, uh, it's slightly trickier. I won't touch that uh, topic here, but it's slightly different in males. There's another variation of the same theme. Uh, sometimes you can take the uh, incision into the temporal hairline as well. Uh, this is one more variation. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve, then you can tailor the incision according to that. The various planes of dissection in facelift. So you have the subcutaneous and the subperiosteal. The subcutaneous uh, uh, facelifts are no longer done. The reason is that all the tension of uh, lifting the tissues is on the skin, as there's no dissection done in the uh, subs mass layer. Uh, when you're lifting the skin up and uh, removing the excess skin and then suturing, all the tension goes onto the skin. So the scars are not really that good. And as uh, you're not lifting any deeper tissues, and then the results also not very long lasting. In the subperiosteal dissection, the dissection is actually uh, goes from the temple into the mid face in a subperiosteal uh, plane. The lift is actually very good, but uh, it leads to prolonged edema. It can take up to three months for the edema to settle. So um, some surgeons prefer not to do that because now we have these favor techniques, which are mass uh, manipulation kind of techniques. You can apply cation, um, and then you can have soft mass techniques like implication, deep plane, extended deep plane, or composite uh, facelifts, uh, which lead to much more durable lifts. And also the tension is on the mass layer. So as there's no tension on the skin, uh, if you're careful, then the scars can be really, really, really fine and not really perceptible. So just to mention what we do in different techniques, in plication, essentially what you're doing is the smash in this posterior part of the face, which is the non-mobile part, you just lift up the flap uh, of uh, smash, no, sorry, not lift up, you hold the smash, you fold it on itself, and then you suture, something like this. Then we have a variation of that. We can size the smash, we can remove part of the mass in that area and then suture the edges together. So both these techniques will lead to some improvement um, in the lower part of the face and maybe uh, some improvement in the upper part of the neck as well. But then there's no lift of tissues of the mid face. So if there's any mid face descent, then these incisions, uh, these techniques are not gonna be very helpful uh, for the patient. But uh, these are quite helpful for patients who are young and you want minimal facelift uh, uh, and with minimal downtime because the recovery is much faster. Then we also have another variation. Uh, it's called max lift. <laughs> Excuse me. And in max lift, essentially what we're doing is 
we are using sutures to suspend the smas to the deep temporal fascia. And again, uh, the smas is not dissected. There's no sub-smas dissection. It's just that the suture passes like a purse string through the smas and then it's hitched uh, to the deep temporal fascia. Again, the results, uh, because there's no sub-smas dissection, not that long lasting. And uh, the lift in the mid phase is not that uh, great. So as a result, people have sort of moved to the sub-smas techniques. And to understand those techniques, what we have to understand is the SMAS itself. So the SMAS is actually stronger in the posterior superior part and becomes weaker in the lower and the medial part. And then as we go interior to the um, zygomaticus major muscle, it actually becomes very thin and attenuated. So if we want to lift the anterior facial tissues, what we have to do is to make an incision in the SMAS posterior to the zygomaticus major muscle and then lift all the tissues anterior to that in a sub plane. So essentially the skin, the subcutaneous fat, which is a malar fat pad, and the SMAS are lifted as one unit. So you get all this pull on the mid face, thus lifting all the tissues as one layer. So this transition zone between the stronger to the weaker uh, SMAS is what we call as the deep plane transition zone. Uh, so essentially the incision that I showed you earlier, going from the lateral canthus to the angle of the mandible, somewhere in this area here, is through that deep plane transition zone. So you're making the incision in the thickest mass and then going sub mass and lifting up the tissues on the interior face. So that's the incision uh, that we would make. You can extend that into the neck as well, like I showed you earlier. And then we end up with all the spaces, release the ligaments and lift up the tissues on the interior face as one unit. What we don't want to do is to separate the skin and the smas in the interior face in this area here. So that has to be kept as one unit so we can lift up the whole thing as one unit uh, posteriorly. So just release the ligaments and then lift up. There are other ways of doing it. Uh, some people use the high smas uh, incision in which the incision is made over the zygomatic arch. There's another way of doing it is the low smash incision in which the incision is made below the zygomatic arch in this uh, fashion here. So the proponents of high smash say that you can get a better lift of the mid face using the technique. Um, the low smash uh, incisions have a disadvantage that they can't really lift the mid face. All the lift is only in the lower face and uh, of the upper neck. The, the issue with high smash uh, is that people say that the Facial nerve is actually very close in that area, the temporal branch. So there's a risk of injury to the nerve. So a lot of people don't want to do that technique because there are other options available. So let's talk about the facial nerve in more detail now. This is the final part of my talk. So the reported incidence of injury to the facial nerve is anywhere between one to 20% and permanent injury of uh, uh, less than a percent. In fact, 0.1% in an experienced hands. But this is one thing that all uh, facelift surgeons are afraid of because you don't really want to give facial nerve palsy to a patient who's come for uh, aesthetic improvement. So, uh, like I said before, the branches of facial nerve leave the parotid gland, then they're under the parotid mesenteric fascia, go anteriorly, and then they become superficial near the ligaments. So, these are the branches which are dissected. So, for the temporal branch of the facial nerve, uh, the surface landmark is Pittingi's line, which is a line drawn from uh, 0.5 centimeter inferior medial to the lobule to about one to one and a half centimeter lateral to the uh, brow, lateral part of the brow. So the branches of the, uh, the temporal branches of the facial nerve are along this line. And uh, there are no branches for about 1.7 centimeter anterior to the uh, helix and for about 2.5 centimeter lateral to the uh, uh, lateral canthus. So this area is safe and this area is safe. So this is uh, what we use, uh, sorry, just a few more slides. You can see this branching pattern of the temporal um, nerve in this area here. You can have two to three rami. Uh, the important thing to remember is there are not many connections between these rami and the other branches of the facial nerve. So if there's any injury, the recovery of the temporal branch is very, very minimal, if at all. So this is the safe zone that I talked about earlier. Uh, or the zygomatic arch, there's no 
um, rather than the facial lymph here. So that's the reason why we make this incision um, all the way to the periosteum in this area here to enter into the subperiosteal zone uh, for the pre zygomatic space entry. So that's the reason and we know that we can be safe in that area. And similarly for uh, mid-phase uh, lift using the endoscopic techniques when you come from the temple, again, the same plane can be used and we can go all the way to the nose through the technique uh, by being safe. Uh, and we know that the facial nerve is not going to be the, in, in that area. And that incision can then, uh, in the periosteum can then be carried uh, backwards along the zygomatic arch Again, uh, staying deep to the nerve and elevating the tissues that way. So uh, this is just to show what happens. Uh, the nerve comes out of the parotid glands. It's under the parotid mesotic fascia. It's just superficial to the zygomatic arch in this area here, just superficial to the um, periosteum in this area here. And then as it goes more superficially, it becomes uh, more superficial. And finally, it comes to lie under the temporal parietal fascia, the superficial temporal fascia and before it supplies the frontalis muscle from the undersurface. So again, just showing the nerve. So one centimeter above the zygomatic arch, the nerve actually lies under a fascia, which is known as a parotid temporal fascia, which is a fascia which is separate from the smash layer. So that's how we can make this high smash incision, because there's a plane of dissection between the smash and the temporoparietal fascia. So the incision would be made over the zygomatic arch, and then you would dissect in this plane, staying superficial to the nerve, which is under this fascia. Uh, and as you go more superiorly, the nerve becomes more superficial, finally comes to lie uh, under the uh, parotid temporal fascia in this area here, and about two centimeters above, then it becomes more superficial and lies uh, sort of uh, deep to the temporoparietal fascia, and then uh, supplies the muscle from the undersurface. Again, showing the same thing. This is the basis for the high smash uh, technique incision. Um, with the low smash, uh, we are actually in uh, tissue which is sort of more uh, as thicker, and uh, uh, so there's no danger to the uh, to the temporal branch of the facial nerve uh, as a result. So the zygomatic branch is actually a centimeter below the zygomatic arch. And it goes from the posterior phase to the anterior phase. Along with that, you have the temporal branch, uh, temporal artery, the transverse uh, uh, facial artery, sorry, uh, which runs uh, along with the nerve. And the nerve then branches into the um, inferior branch as well as the superior branch uh, and supplies the zygomaticus major muscle from the uh, inferior surface. So during the section, deep plane uh, facelift, we have to be superficial to the zygomaticus major muscle when we're dissecting this area here. Here you can see the parotid gland, uh, sorry, the parotid duct. Uh, so the unsafe plane of dissection is under the zygomatic major muscle. The safe plane of dissection is superficial to it. Here you can see all the branches of the zygomaticus, uh, sorry, the uh, zygomatic branch supplying the muscle from the undersurface. Here is the communicating branch. This is the uh, upper buccal branch. Here you would have the buccal fat pad. You can see the branches are superficial to the buccal fat pad. And again, uh, this uh, dissection is just showing the safe plane of dissection. And this would be the unsafe plane of dissection. As you can see here, you can easily damage the nerve if you're dissecting in this plane here. It's easier to dissect, uh, to damage the inferior branch because it is a bit more superficial uh, uh, when you're dissecting in that area. Okay, so then just the communicating branch that I showed you earlier, the buccal fat pad in the branch is going just superficial to it. So we have to be careful in that area here. And then finally, the um, buccal branch, again, you have the upper and the lower buccal branch. And both of these are in very close proximity to the uh, key ligaments. So we have to be careful when dissecting it. But uh, just to uh, remember the branches are actually under the uh, fascia, outside the spaces, whether it's the middle space or the lower space, the marks is actually outside the spaces in these uh, mesentries, which line, lie between the spaces. So um, like you saw earlier, when I showed you the dissection from the posterior view, 
if you're in the spaces, you know that between the spaces, we have uh, the branches of the fish enough. So you just have to be careful when you're dissecting there. Then finally, we have the marginal bendable nerve, uh, which again comes out through the tritistum auricular fascia. And then it lies under the investing layer of fascia outside the space, the low space, and then goes anteriorly. So if we are superficial to the deep uh, cervical fascia, we know we're going to be safe. The nerve is going to be safe. So that is uh, what we use uh, as plane of dissection. So this uh, just shows if you're making a platysma flap posteriorly, and this is the plane that we have to enter. So we have to be superficial to this fascia because the branches of the nerve are actually under the fascia here. So the nerve, when it comes out from this area, is under this uh, a little bit of fat, subsumized fat, and it's sort of hidden by that, and then it starts becoming more superficial under the fascia. Yeah, just swing that subsmass fat, the marginal mandible nerve, then it goes anteriorly, and then it causes uh, the mandible uh, superficial to the facial vessels. So uh, the nerve is within about half a centimeter of uh, the gonion in 82-83% uh, of patients, and within a centimeter of uh, the facial vessels as they cross the inferior border of the mandible. So these are the areas where we have to be careful. Again, just showing the mar marginal mandibular nerve. It's crossing the vessels here. And then in this area, it becomes superficial. It becomes subplatysmal. Uh, so this is the danger zone. And uh, the facial vessels are the sort of interior most uh, limit of our dissection when we're dissecting from the posterior uh, approach. Again, uh, low premacetic space. And this is the danger zone because the nerve is actually subplatysmal. It's going to supply the platysmal muscle from the undersurface here. Then it goes anteriorly, it divides into three or four branches. And those branches are all uh, above the level of the inferior border of the mandible and they supply the depressor muscles uh, of the face in that area. So again, angle of the mandible, uh, the safe limit of dissection in the lower premacetic space, facial vessels. Um, um, we can dissect, we don't really dissect the uh, mandibular cutaneous ligament very often, but if we have to dissect it, we will dissect it from the interior uh, uh, approach by making incision under the mentum, either in a subperiosteal or a subcutaneous plane. Actually, there is a vessel which runs along with the uh, ligament and uh, um, that can bleed quite a lot. So people prefer not to uh, cut this ligament if at all possible. Again, this ligament is about 25 millimeter anterior to the uh, anterior edge of the palpable part of the masseter muscle. So then the last nerve that I'm going to talk about is the cervical branch. Cervical branch, um, you can have up from one to three branches. And in more than 80% of patients, there will be a two or three branches present. So the nerve is present. Uh, it comes out from the parotid gland um, and lies uh, sort of in branches in this area here, which is about 1.5 to 2 centimeter um, below and the angle of the mandible. And uh, it usually lies in this mesentery, which uh, is essentially, um, so this is the low premacetic space. This is the, the, the section which is subplatysmal dissection in the neck. So you have these two here, and the nerve actually lies between the two. And this uh, mesentery here. So we try not to cut this mesentery. Uh, I mean, you can, but you have to be really, really careful. So because the nerve, like I said, is actually here. So the cervical branch is the only branch which becomes subplatysmal as soon as it comes out of uh, the parotid. So it's uh, more at risk. And uh, in a proportion of patients, about 5%, it actually gives branches to the marginal mandibular or supplies the depressor muscles uh, of the um, of the anterior face directly. So uh, it's good not to injure it if possible. Then you can have branches uh, of the marginal mandibular coming out from up to about 1.4 centimeter behind the angle of the mandible and up to about four centimeter below the angle, uh, low part of the mandible. So there can be a few branches in that area. So when we're dissecting in this area, the dissection is always in a vertical plane uh, staying uh, 
uh, sort of in the plane of the nerve when we're dissecting, because you know it's going to become subplatysmal as soon as we um, uh, it comes out from the parotid gland. So for deep, deep plane dissection, uh, and the dissection is actually subcutaneous to the deep plane transition zone. Then we enter into the submass uh, layer. The dissection becomes uh, submass. In the neck, a safe plane of dissection is actually supraplatysmal. But lots and lots of surgeons now are going subplatysmal because you can get a much better um, definition of uh, the neck by uh, doing that. But then you have to be careful with the cervical as well as the uh, marginal mandibular branch of the facial now. So this is a video that I made of the dissection. So you would normally stop your dissection. Sorry, I'll just go back in a minute for a minute. So you normally stop your dissection, uh, the subcutaneous dissection, somewhere. Here. So this is the limit of your subcutaneous dissection, and then we would enter into the uh, deep plane for deep plane facelift. But here, for uh, uh, for just showing it more clearly, I've dissected the subcutaneous plane all the way anteriorly as well. So then this is where you would enter into the subcutaneous, sorry, the submass layer. This is marking. Uh, again, this is the low part of the mandible. This is the zygomatic arch area. This is the extension to the neck. So this is where we're entering the pre-zygomatic space. As you can see here, you go all the way in that area. That's a safe zone, all the way uh, to the periosteum and then dissect. Again, this uh, uh, space doesn't have any important structures, so you can go all the way to the nose in this space. So you can see that, that's what I'm trying to show here. And then you make the incision in the smash layer, and then you can uh, see all these ligaments. This is the lower premacetic space, the middle and the upper premacetic space. This is the prezygomatic uh, pre space here. That's the malar ligament that needs to be released. If you don't release it, then we can't get a good, uh, so that has to be a sharp uh, release. But the thing that we have to be careful about is the zygomaticus major muscle, which is just anterior to that. You can actually just start seeing it just now over here. And then I'll follow that anteriorly. You can see the muscle here. It's becoming clearer now. That's the muscle. It's a very thin muscle. Um, you can easily damage it. So nearly coming to the end of my talk now. And then you stay over the muscle when you're dissecting and follow it all the way to the uh, oral commissure. And if you're superficial to it, then you know you're away from the nerve because the nerve is actually under the muscle. And all the bunches of facial nerve are going to be along these ligaments here. So when we're dissecting along the ligaments, we're going to be a bit more careful. So now I'm just dissecting in the spaces. This is going uh, all the way to the oral commissure. So we can get, get release of this tissue uh, all the way to the uh, front part of the face because th that's where the problem really lies. Then we're releasing these ligaments. It's better to be a bit superficial than uh, go deep. So then you can see some of the branches of the facial nerve coming into view. So we preserve those. So there's no assistant here. I'm doing everything myself, recording as well as dissecting. So sometimes I have to stop. Again, branch of the patient now, you can see that here. Another one here. Then we have seen superficial. So that's the lower space. This is where you have the platysma. So this is the danger zone that I was talking about earlier. So the nerve is going to be uh, subplatysmal in this area here. And uh, as you uh, saw from the presentation, the roof of the lower space is the platysma. The facial nerve, um, so the facial artery and the vessels uh, and the vein are going to be in this area here. 
So that's the entire limit of our section in this area. So you can see the platysperm muscle here. And then I've done some subplatysmal dissection in the neck as well. So that's the mesentery that I showed you earlier, which will contain the cervical branch of the facial nerve. And then I made a flap out of this by making a cut in the platysma um, in this part here. So the cut has been made in the platysma. So now you have two vectors, one for the face and one for the neck. So that will lead to more definition of the Then we would anchor that to the platysma auricular fascia as well as the deep temporal fascia. And the neck would go into the master periosteum. Just to show that you can really get a lift of uh, going all the way to the commissure as well as middle label fold using this technique. And then I've done some dissections after that to show the branches of the nerve, which have all been preserved. You can see these small branches going all the way anteriorly. Uh, to the uh, orbicularis of, of uh, oris muscle. Again, just showing the pre septal space, the pre zygomatic space, the optomedial ligament, orbicularis oculi muscle, the zygomaticus major muscle, and then all the nerves dissected out. So, uh, so my take home message is that uh, a thorough understanding of the anatomy of the tissue planes, mass, submass, tissue spaces, the retaining ligaments, and especially the relation to the relationship to the facial nerve is important uh, to perform a space lift that is safe and also effective. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, sir, Dr. Sandeep, sir, and uh, Dr. Ganga for such an enriching talk. I think uh, you covered everything from the uh, forehead to the neck and such beautiful illustrations, Sandeep, sir. I think uh, we as ophthalmologists don't go beyond the cheek that much in the anatomy, but with your diagrams, I think if the postgraduates visit, especially the fellows also in Plasti, it will be so nice to uh, revisit that lecture and learn so much from it. Ganga thank sir, you. any words from you? And thank you so much for inviting Sandeep sir on our platform. It was a pleasure to have him actually. And more than anything else, he's the one person who organized these 11 days of facial plastic surgery courses. Okay. I encourage all facial plastic surgeons, whether you're ocular plastic, rhinology, or uh, uh, maxillofacial or ENT to attend those courses because you get a completely different perspective to the facial anatomy that we read in the textbook. So just a pitch for his course. I have no financial or other conflicts of interest. But, so, uh, the last uh, video was also so nice and one man show. So it was like really nice to see all those illustrations. I think I can just take two questions. We had a few, but I think you covered some in the anatomy, sir. So one is the role of facelift post -traumatic, in post-traumatic cases with scar or fractures. Does the same principle holds true if this mass is like locally damaged or inflamed or scarred or any uh, tips when we are doing uh, things? Sure. Uh, yeah, for, uh, I mean, facelift, yes, we can use mid face lift, for example, for some of the trauma cases, especially if uh, uh, there's loss of, uh, uh, sort of support to the low lid area uh, or if there's facial nerve paralysis, uh, which has not recovered then it can be used uh, to give some symmetry to the face as well. Uh, but the same principle applies. You still have to find the same planes. Uh, be careful of the facial nerve. So the principle remains the same. It's just that the 
approach is being used for different purpose rather than uh, rejuvenation we using it more for uh, reconstruction or uh, support uh, to the tissues okay my chip in uh... Uh, you're right in the sense that if you look at a patient who's had a complete facial trauma, they age far more than the normal patient. And that's because both the trauma and more importantly, the dissection we do, whether it's a coronal approach with the upper part or the middle part of the face, or the dissection we do in the mid-facial part, if we do not suspend the soft tissues at the end of the procedure, the soft tissues sag. And if, especially if you're doing a unilateral trauma procedure, that side ages far more than the other side. So one of the things that, that we do as an essential part of the procedure, reconstructive procedure at the end, is make sure we do a suspension of the soof or the soft tissue of the forehead. So they hung up there so that they don't sag and prevent premature aging of the face. It's a practical tip that uh, sometimes we overlook when we do these reconstructive procedures. Fine, it's well taken. The last question from my side would be, uh, one viewer has asked, uh, dermal treatments following surgery, like the facelift surgery, what are the relative contraindications and what should be the time gap between the two? Okay, so you can um, actually do laser resurfacing at the same time, uh, especially if you're doing a deep plane lift, because uh, the vascularity to the tissues is maintained. So that's one of the benefits because the flap is thick, it's a smash flap which has its own vascularity. So uh, it's possible to do resurfacing at the same time. So, and a lot of surgeons do that. Anga, sir, any points from you? Uh, no, I, I've stopped doing a lot of the skin rejuvenation because of the kind of work and that I do. It's, I used to do it about 10, 15 years ago. And nowadays I don't do it. I, I leave it to the aestheticians or the aesthetic uh, plastic or dermatologist to do that. Sure. So I just opened the platform to all the viewers, uh, all the participants on the Zoom platform. Uh, I see many people who have joined in. Anybody would like to uh, ask any questions to both our speakers? If not, then we'll call it a day. No. I think, uh, yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat box also. So... Just, I think we'll call it a day, sir. And thank you so much again for joining, like sparing your time such like late in the day in Singapore. But thank you so much for joining for such a detailed lecture and such beautiful illustrations. I'll definitely revisit this talk many times, I think. Thank you. And uh, just an announcement, uh, we'll next meet on September 29, um, which will be lasers in periocular area by Dr. Nitin. So hope to see you all on this Friday and good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank Sandeep. you. Thanks, Sandeep. Yeah. Thank you, Shafali. Yes, Bye. Sir.